Welcome to She Persisted. I'm your host, Sadie Sutton. Every Friday, I post interviews about mental health, dialectical behavioral therapy, and teenage life. These episodes break down my mental health journey, teach skills to help you cope with life, and showcase testimonials from individuals, including teens just like you. Whether you've struggled yourself or just want to improve your mental fitness, this podcast is your inspiration to live a life you love and keep persisting. It's important to understand that it's not a character flaw. Your child doesn't have um, ADHD because they're a bad child or because you're a bad parent. This is a condition that it's, it's not all the way understood, but we know that treatment, you know, whether it's for boys or for girls, even though girls seem to get diagnosed later in life, treatment for boys and girls equally, they do just as well. And the results show that if you treat and they have ADHD, it can it can change your life. It can really change your life. This week's GBT skill is the PLEA skill. We've talked about it before, but it's so relevant to this week's episode. And Dr. Sarfro does dive into it in bits and pieces. So I wanted to reiterate it at the beginning of the episode. So PLEA is an acronym that stands for treat physical illness, eat balanced meals, avoid mood altering drugs, sleep balanced, and exercise. So this skill works to decrease your physical emotional vulnerability and decrease your likelihood of struggling with mental health challenges. When we're sleep deprived, malnourished, not taking our meds, not exercising, we are more likely to be irritable, hangry, exhausted, you name it. So this skill works to make sure that that baseline is good to go. You're staying on top of these things and setting yourself up for success. So physical illness is pretty simple. If you're sick, you're taking time to rest, to recuperate, you're regularly going to the doctor. If you are taking meds regularly, you're making sure you're taking those. Small tip, one thing that I want to insert here, if you take melatonin, one of the best tips that I learned from my time in treatment was to take it at the same time every single night. If you struggle with insomnia, you know that when you wait to take melatonin, you're like, oh no, I'm good, I'm tired, I'll go to sleep, and then you don't, and then you're up at 3 a.m. and you're like, do I even take melatonin now because it's so late? What if I can't get up? So if you take it at the same time every night, you avoid that process. You are kind of anticipating the insomnia if it comes on. If not, you're already asleep. You're good to go. So that's one of my favorite tips. Next is eating balanced meals. I am currently working on this and making sure that I'm eating food that is fueling my body and making me feel good. So one kind of inner monologue tip that I'm doing here is asking myself, how will this make my body feel long term? How will this make my body feel two to three hours from now instead of like, what should I be eating? What is a quote unquote good food to eat? So asking yourself, how will this make me feel and making sure you're staying balanced with that. Avoid mood altering drugs. I always like to bring up on this one, caffeine is something to be keep in mind here. If you're anxiety prone, just keep an eye on how caffeine makes you feel. Are you more jittery? Are you more anxious? Etc. You get the deal. I did an episode two weeks ago with Dr. Faber. I'll link it in today's show notes all about how mood altering drugs like alcohol, vaping, and marijuana impact our moods. If you want to learn more about that and understand like kind of what you're getting into, I'll link that in the show notes. Sleep balanced. This is my number one mental health tip. Anyone asks me, I say, you need sleep. You need to sleep more. You need to get enough sleep. Teenagers are not getting enough sleep and it is detrimental to your mental health. The difference in my mental health from when I wasn't sleeping through the night to when I was getting eight hours was like suicidally depressed to like actually functioning. Like that's not an exaggeration. That was the shift I saw. So make sure you're getting enough sleep, make sure you're prioritizing sleep, and I'll link an episode in the show notes about how you can improve that process. Last one is moving, getting exercise. Again, this also helps with sleep. This helps you have your appetite regulated. It helps with physical illness to improve your immunity. Moving and staying active and getting outdoors is so important for your mental health. You release endorphins. You know it. You've heard it before, but so important for physical health. So a little longer than normal, but I wanted to give you those extra tips and tricks. So let's dive into the rest of the episode. Hello, hello, and welcome to She Persisted. If you're new here, I'm so excited you're here. Make sure you subscribe, hit follow so you don't miss any new episodes. And go ahead and send me a DM and let me know you are a new listener and you're tuning into the podcast. I would love to connect with you. And if you are returning, welcome back. I'm so excited that you're here. We have an amazing interview today with Dr. Kojo Sarfo. When I was thinking about what episodes I wanted to put out in the next couple of months, I realized that I had not done an episode on ADHD, and I wanted to find an expert to give their perspective on this, offer their insight rather than just kind of speaking blindly, and so I thought, who would be better than Dr. Kojo Sarfo? 
And if you are on mental health TikTok, you've definitely seen his videos before. He's always talking about different ways that ADHD presents and can impact your lifestyle and all these different things. So he seemed like the perfect individual to dive into this. And the interview did not disappoint. It's an amazing conversation. We talk all about what the diagnosis process looks like, what you can expect, what ADHD looks like, how it presents differently in men versus women and children versus teenagers and resources that are helpful, how to support your kid if they have ADHD. Just so many helpful pieces of information for you to take away. If you listened to last week's episode with Dr. Alexander Solomon, I talked in the intro about working to deepen connections and continue to build relationships and all of that kind of stuff. We're doing a follow-up moment. We are circling back to that. Um, I think it's so fitting. I'm recording this on Halloween and we're coming right out of Halloween weekend and this year especially because we're on the tail end of COVID, if you can even say that, because many people are vaccinated. Halloween did not fall on a school night. It's just like kind of a perfect storm. And so if you struggle with FOMO, the holidays especially can be a really difficult time to navigate that because people are very connected and sharing that on social media. And so when you're not feeling as connected, that can be really tough and it can take a hit on your self-esteem and your inner monologue and all of these kinds of things. And so as Halloween was happening and we were seeing everyone being uber connected and coordinated costumes and all of these different things going on, I wanted to be really intentional with my inner monologue, and this was a shift I was making for myself, which was that instead of focusing on all the ways that I could have done better in building relationships and adjusting to college and getting to know people, I focused on what I'd done so far and what I did this weekend. How did I make an effort to connect with people? How did I put myself out there and ask people to spend time together or get coffee this week or grab lunch? How did I start a conversation or initiate an interaction? Because those ones are really important to mention. I think we get so caught up in all the ways that things don't go well that we we forget how many things are going our way, how many wins we're having, how many things we should be celebrating that have happened in our lives or that we have done for ourselves. So however your Halloween went this weekend, whether you felt super connected or you felt more isolated, if you felt super confident or you were struggling, I want you to think of three things that you did to work on yourself and work on your mental health. And that means building relationships, that means improving your inner monologue, that means putting yourself out there, that means doing the opposite of what you felt like doing. Three little wins that you can celebrate and give yourself a pat on the back because I know you just weren't going in the opposite direction. I know you did things that you were proud of and that you can celebrate. So what are those? Take a minute, write them down, reflect on that, and I'm proud of you for whatever those things were. So today's guest is Dr. Kojo Sarfo. If you want to follow along with him after this episode, his Instagram is D-R-K-O-J-O-S-A-R-F-O. His TikTok handle is the same, except for it's dr.kojosarfo. He's one of my favorite people to follow on Instagram and TikTok. He posts so much amazing mental health educational content that you can incorporate into your social media consumption. But Dr. Sarfo is a social media content creator as well as a mental health nurse practitioner and psychotherapist. He is currently practicing so he has tons of up-to-date current insight to offer from working with current patients as well as answering and fielding tons of questions on social media and having a feel for what people are confused about what they want support on etc so this is an amazing conversation all about adhd and let's just dive into it so welcome to she persisted i'm so excited to have you here today thank you for having me I want to dive in and go deep on ADHD in adolescence, how it looks differently between girls and boys, how that can change as teens get older. So just laying a foundation, what is ADHD? What does it look like? And yeah, just a little bit of a background there. Okay, well, um, so ADHD is a cluster, you know, where you see things, some, where you see things that will represent hyperactivity and impulsivity and also inattention. And a lot of people get confused because people have this notion where you think that everybody's a little ADHD. It's not quite like that. You might have some mm-hmm. symptoms, you know, that people with ADHD have, but in order to have ADHD, you have to have, you know, a few of these symptoms, you know, and it has to be technically before the age of 12, but so many people aren't diagnosed in time. So that's why you have people, especially women, sometimes in the late twenties and finally receive a diagnosis. But with ADHD, when it comes to inattention, you can see things such as disorganization, you know, losing track of time, losing important items such as your keys, your wallet, your phone, things that you actually need, being late to places, mm-hmm. turning assignments in late, and then with the hyperactivity side of things and impulsivity, you can see people who, you know, 
might cut you off mid-conversation, unbeknownst to themselves. You might see individuals who are impulsive when it comes to shopping, maybe relationships. You might see impulsivity as it results, as it relates to talking over others. So these are some of the things that you see when it comes to ADHD, and it has to like have a marked impairment on your life. So for the person who struggles with ADHD, mm -hmm. you can have somebody who is you know outwardly successful. They but they might struggle with. You know the dishes or laundry or they might have relationship issues that frustrate them and when it's undiagnosed a lot of times adults present with anxiety and or depression uh, and frustration because they don't know what's going on and it's kind of like, you know disability or mental health condition so that's important that we talk about it mm -hmm. uh, in the main ways that it presents so do you find that a lot of the times when adhd is undiagnosed it has these secondary conditions or is adhd more often the secondary condition to something like depression or anxiety. So it depends, you know, it can be different for two different people. So it's tough to say mm -hmm. what the more common presentation is, but at least from what I've seen, I've seen a, a lot of times where people present with, you know, classic symptoms of, you, know, you can have the neurovegetative symptoms of depression, you know, not eating, not sleeping, or sleeping too much, eating too much, things of that nature. And you can have somebody who mm -hmm. appears to be anxious and they're fearful and they're worried um, and they're on edge. But it's kind of like, I saw a meme online that I liked it. It was the little Scooby-Doo meme where, you know, you pull the cover off and you see who it really is at the end of those episodes. Mm -hmm. That's kind of how it is with uh, ADHD a lot of times. Like, you know, somebody will appear anxious and depressed or they may have comorbid eating disorders or whatever the case may be. And then when you, you know, dig a little deeper and then you take off the cape, you're like, oh my gosh, this is actually ADHD that's going on here and this person wasn't diagnosed. Mm -hmm. No wonder why they're frustrated and it's leading to all these other different things. Yeah. So what are the differences in presentation between men and women? Of course, it's different for everyone. So these aren't just 100% certain to be presentations, but generally, what do you see as differences there? So uh, with, um, you know, boys, a lot of times you have the classic picture of the, the young boy who is like interrupting in class and he's hyper he can't sit still and, and he's disrupting class that type of picture you know if you see a, a child like that especially a boy the likelihood that he'll be referred to a specialist is very high because he's disrupting class right class but a lot of times with women you see them present with more so inattentive symptoms and it's interesting because when i've been you know looking at adhd in general even people who quote unquote grow out of it which really just means that they find a way to you know cope with you know their symptoms even mm -hmm. those people they some of the the inattentive symptoms linger into persist into adulthood so with women they're more likely to present with the inattentive symptoms and that can be quite devastating because you can't catch it you know and for us as clinicians it's hard to you know put a finger on what's going on you, you just might see that she has low self-esteem she's behind on things i mean even adhd is somewhat poorly understood you know amongst mental health professionals because it's still some of a controversial thing and it's almost as if you have to have it, you know, or extensively have studied it to mm -hmm. really understand the, you know, the massive cost of ADHD and how much it can, you know, take away from your life. So with women, when they present with the more so inattentive yeah. symptoms, you know, they might be quiet, disorganized, you know, they might be restless, but it's hard to catch it. And it's unfortunate because it's not until women, a lot of women are in their 20s and 30s that they get diagnosed. And they have, you know, years and decades of trauma from having to live life in a world that's not set up for them. And women are also rewarded for masking their symptoms, you know. So if it can be something like you have ADHD is undiagnosed and then, you know, the emotional dysregulation has you, you know, your mood going up and down. And you might get to the point where you start to make fun of yourself, you know, and you see a lot of self-deprecation because that's kind of your way of protecting yourself. Because when people make fun of you, it actually really hurts. So a lot of times women will overcome, you know, and this is how, they, this is like a survival tactic. That's how they make it through life. So it's important to, you know, be uh, on the lookout for some of those subtle symptoms of ADHD uh, in women, whether it's, you know, being a little bit late with assignments or somebody who seems to be detached in the middle of a conversation. They're like, oh, what'd you say? They're not paying attention. So it's important to, I tell women all the time, like if you think that you might have ADHD, you know, maybe ask your friends, like, you know, what am I like? Do I cut you off in mid-conversation? Do I lose a lot of things? A lot of times we, we need the collateral information from friends and family members to kind of help us, like, point us in the right direction for us to think, like, oh, this might be, you know, ADHD. Maybe let's give her a questionnaire and see if we can 
ask some questions and get more in the right direction. How do ADHD symptoms evolve with age? Is it something that's constant from that before 12 diagnosis period or as you get into your 20s and 30s, it, it changes, it evolves as you learn to cope with that? So it's, it is a good question. And I've seen some studies that you know seem to suggest that there's a developmental delay with people who have ADHD as opposed to, you know, the neurotypical person. So your brain is still developing and mm-hmm. is not developing as fast as, you know, the standard or normal, whatever normal is, will be developing. So with people with ADHD, a lot of times, uh, like I said, sometimes people do, you know, grow out of symptoms, which I think is just the way of coping with it to the point where it's not as big uh, of a, a issue. But a lot of times we see that, you know, for people who have ADHD, that it doesn't go away. You know, it's something that does affect people. Like, even if you were diagnosed in childhood, you know, if you're 31 and you're diagnosed with ADHD, you had ADHD when you were a child. It's just that it wasn't caught. You know, it doesn't come out of any, you know, nowhere at age 27 or 28, but something that you were having, you know, as a child. And from what I've seen, uh, especially in my experience, ADHD doesn't go away. And it's kind of frustrating when you have to tell. The frustration comes from telling parents because if somebody is, you know, yeah. 15, 16, they get diagnosed and they get treatment and it's helping them out. Like they know because it's helping them out. But sometimes parents have a hard time understanding that ADHD, at least in my experience, like it's not going anywhere. It's more about having to deal with it because sometimes the symptoms persist into adulthood and it frustrates you in different ways. This week's episode is sponsored by Teen Counseling. So if you've heard of BetterHelp, which I'm sure you have, Teen Counseling is their teen brand. It's an online therapy program and they have over 14,000 licensed therapists in their network. They offer support on things like depression, anxiety, relationships, trauma, substance use, and of course, ADHD. This is a great way to get professional support and begin your therapy journey, dip your toe into the water without actually having to go into the therapist's office, navigate that whole thing if you're not ready to take that step. So what you're going to do is you're going to go to teencounseling.com slash she persisted. You're going to fill out a super quick survey about what you want to focus on. Again, all the things I mentioned, ADHD, trauma, relationships, depression, anxiety, you name it. They're going to send a consent link to your parents and I try to, don't worry, I know exactly what they're going to say. They're going to say, Sadie, or whatever your name is, is interested in meeting with a clinician from teencounseling.com. Please learn more here and give consent to treatment. None of your information about what you want to work on or what you will work on in therapy is ever shared with your parents or guardians. They're just giving consent for you to work with a therapist. So from there, you're matched with a therapist that meets your needs and your goals, and you start working via text, talk, and video counseling. I meet with a therapist every single week via video, and it is a game changer to make sure my mental health is maintained and on track and good to go. It's such an amazing support system to have in your toolbox. So I highly, highly recommend trying this out and giving it a shot. So if you want to learn more, you can head to teencounseling.com slash she persisted. Again, that's teencounseling.com slash she persisted to get started today. What are the most common reports, symptoms, presentations that you see teenage girls coming to you with relating to ADHD? So when it comes to, you know, undiagnosed ADHD or, for example, let's take a teenage girl who comes in and if, let's say the eventual diagnosis is ADHD, a lot of times you'll see things such as, you know, from, I've seen women that feel like they're, you know, not like their peers. They're comparing themselves a lot. They feel like they're behind when it comes to schoolwork. You know, they feel like they're very disorganized or just they're having to spend a lot of time finding simple things or they have a hard time shifting from one task to the next. So if they're, you know, doing cheerleading and they enjoy it, they'll excel with that. But things that they don't like to do necessarily, they might really struggle with that. And also with teenage women with ADHD, a lot of times when it's undiagnosed, unfortunately, you may see things such as a higher, you know, uh, rate of car accidents, you know, maybe sexually transmitted infections from impulsive and also substance use disorders. So you might have someone who is, you know, maybe drinking, you know, more than usual. Uh, and they don't really know why they're drinking. Maybe you started off because it was a thing that you did socially with friends, but it became something that helped like calm you down or keep your mind from racing. So a lot of times, sometimes you see these things when it comes to undiagnosed ADHD, especially with patients who are in their teens. And one thing that I've seen is also a low self-esteem. You see that a lot in terms of, mm-hmm. you know, and sometimes it makes sense. Like if you're not able to get things done in time and you don't know if you can't put a finger on it, right? You don't know that it's ADHD. You think that you're... Yeah, your confidence takes a hit right? for you sure. You think you're dumb. You think you're behind. We feel overwhelmed. And then that's where some of the risky behaviors come in because you have that hopelessness because you're not sure what's going on. So 
I think in that situation, it would be normal for anybody to, you know, struggle with their self-esteem. Yeah. We've talked about undiagnosed ADHD and then a little bit on the diagnosis process, but I kind of want to dive deep there and talk about what a teenager could expect if they're like, hey, I recognize these things. I want to talk to my doctor. What does the diagnosis process look like? So uh, this is (laughs) this is an interesting one because people ask this on uh, Mm -hmm. TikTok and there's a couple of different ways. So um, yes, you can go ahead and do neuropsych testing, which can be quite expensive and they can measure. It takes forever, right. too. <laughs> you can measure brain activity and a lot of different things. And at least the way I was trained in school, I think neuropsych testing can be very helpful. Like, there is a place for it. Neuropsych testing can help to sometimes give you objective markers in distinguishing between the different types of ADHD. Like, oh, this person might be more so inattentive or more so hyperactive. But at least the way I think, you know, I could be wrong, but at least the way I think the diagnostic process should go, you come in and, you know, you get the information from the patient. Uh, if they're an adult, then you get information from, you know, if let's say that they have a spouse, you can talk to them and see like, hey, like how is so-and-so like in their day-to-day to pick up on the level of impairment. But if it's a teen, but whether it's a teen or an adult, you know, you come in, you do a full out psychiatric evaluation. That's what I would recommend for people who are watching or on TikTok mm-hmm. to get a diagnosis. You can go to your primary care provider, but I'm going to talk from the perspective of of a specialist. If you go see a psychiatric provider, they'll do a full out psychiatric evaluation. Sometimes it'll take like an hour, maybe 90 minutes. But here you're assessing for everything. And that, that is not only ADHD, but also anxiety, depression, mood disorders such as bipolar one or two, uh, thought disorders such as schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder. You're looking for all of these things because as we know with ADHD, you might have ADHD, but you might also have comorbid anxiety or depression. Or you might have, you know, like I said, an eating disorder. So a full-out psychiatric evaluation will, you know, get a handle on how you're doing right now. And also will ask you questions about, like, your childhood. What what type of child were you? Were you in special education classes? Were you a gifted child? Were you disrupting the class? Things like that. So we'll take past history. Then we'll get what's going on right now. And if we do suspect that there's some ADHD going on, we'll give you a questionnaire and then you know if the questionnaire seems to suggest that this person is a lot high likelihood for them to have ADHD they will ask you more open-ended questions like tell me a little bit about your day or what frustrates you you know we wouldn't say we wouldn't say things like oh uh, can you not focus can you not organize yourself like you're not going to get yeah. any information on that so pretty much it's a 60 minute to an hour and a half evaluation where we ask you questions and a good provider should be able to pick up on ADHD because we have you know, the criteria in the DSM-5 for people 17 and below and adults. So if it matches up, then, mm-hmm. you know, you would have uh, a diagnosis of ADHD uh, or whatever else you're diagnosed with. And a psych evaluation should get the job done. And neuropsych testing can be helpful to confirm, but I don't think it's necessary in diagnosing somebody with ADHD. So, and people don't know that. So that's why it's kind of mm-hmm. convoluted and difficult because people have to go through like a, a series of barriers of tests to get a diagnosis. And I don't understand that process. I think one psych evaluation should get the job done. Yeah. When you're on TikTok, Instagram, all of those, what are the top three questions that people are constantly asking about ADHD? Ooh. Like, what are they always like? We want to know this. This is brings a lot of confusion. What are you asked all the time? Uh, okay. All right. Well, wow. That's a really good question. So I don't know <laughs> in what order, but let me go off some of the, the most common. I know people ask, the difference between ADHD and ADD and ADD. I was going to yeah. ask that. Yeah. ADD is an outdated term. So when somebody says ADD, mm-hmm. they're referring to the inattentive type of ADHD. So atten- attention deficit disorder. Okay. So when you say, oh, my friend is ADD or my, my son has ADHD, ADD, they're referring to somebody who would be within the inattentive side of ADHD. So this is somebody who for forgetful, gotcha. you know, lose things, is organized. So that's... ADD in a nutshell. Another common question I get is mm-hmm. the difference between how it presents in men and women. We talked about that, how women might tend to be more so inattentive. Yeah. Another common question I get is, are the, you know, are the stimulants addictive or are they going to change my personality? And for somebody who's prescribed mm-hmm. like a schedule two stimulant, whether it's Vyvanse, Ritalin, Concerta, or whatever it is, those medications, if you're diagnosed with ADHD and you're given that medication, I think that those are some of the most effective meds we have in psychiatry. You know, I think maybe Mm -hmm. lithium and clausural are the only other ones that are as effective for their condition, but stimulants are very effective. 
They're life-changing measures, in my opinion. And people might feel like their personality is off because maybe they're not as high strung or maybe they're not as like relaxed as they used to be on the medication. But for the person who has ADHD, those medications are extremely helpful uh, and life-changing. And if somebody doesn't have ADHD and the medications are being abused, yes, somebody might be able to focus, but you run the risk of, you know, heart issues, you know, psychosis if it's abused, insomnia. So it's important to make sure that somebody who is taking mm -hmm. medication like that is actually prescribed it. But I'm actually, I'm a huge fan of those medications yeah. when prescribed to somebody who actually has ADHD. This week's episode is brought to you by Sakara. Sakara is a nutrition company that focuses on overall wellness, starting with what you eat. We talked about it in today's intro for our DBT education. A huge part of decreasing your emotional vulnerability is making sure you are eating balanced, eating healthy, and fueling your body with nutrients. So what Sakara is, is organic ready-to-eat meals that are made with powerful plant-based ingredients. They're designed to boost your energy, improve your digestion, get your skin glowing, all of the amazing things. And their meals are delivered around the U.S. to eat at your door. They also sell wellness essentials in addition to their meals. My favorite is their sleepy time tea. It's perfect for your bedtime routine. Again, really honing in on these please skills, making sure you're sleeping balanced. My other favorite of theirs is their breakfast. You don't actually have to order breakfast, lunch, and dinner for your meal plan. You can just do certain meals. So for me, I know that having a good breakfast is so important to setting my day up for success. I look forward to it. It boosts my mood. And it's perfect for a busy student who doesn't have time to make a giant meal but wants to get their protein, their nutrients at the beginning of the day. You can also shop on their website, other supplements, teas, powders, granola, you name it. So if you want to get your hands on these amazing products and meals, you can head to Sakara.com and use code XOSADY at checkout for 20% off your first order. Again, that's Sakara.com and use code XOSADY at checkout for 20% off. So that was exactly what I was going to ask you next. We talked about how you can't like get rid of ADHD, right. but there's lots of different treatments that you can do. So walk me through what those options are, what is recommended in different cases, and and what teenagers can do both independently and then with the help of a professional. Okay, great question. So I, th I think, obviously, let's start with the professional side of things. That's where I urge people to, you know, eventually go if you can find a provider or if you can start with your primary care provider, you know, like your doctor you see every year for physicals. A lot of them are very qualified to, um, and comfortable, you know, diagnosing and treating ADHD. So professional help is always the best, you know, meds, therapy, or a combination of the two. Uh, but in terms of practical things you can do at home, uh, there's a couple of things. So when you wake up, it's important to eat breakfast, you know, eat a good nutritious breakfast, stay hydrated, drink water, and get some aerobic exercise in. I think if you can eat breakfast every morning, get a little bit of exercise and have a routine, those three things right there, like you're already ahead of like a lot of people. Like I think that's very helpful. People people yeah. don't um, realize how effective that is to get you a good breakfast, I you know, to get some exercise in uh, and to have a simple routine because with ADHD, you're going to struggle to have a consistent routine. So something super simple, like you wake up in the morning, do 10 push-ups, and you say affirmations, and you get breakfast. If you can do that over time, it's going to boost your mm -hmm. self-esteem. You'll have more confidence, and confidence is something that is very important with ADHD. The way you speak to yourself is important. Make sure that you're hanging out with people who um, lift you up. Of course, they have to keep you accountable, but if they make you feel bad for how you are, pay attention to how you feel after you hang out with a group of people. If they don't make you feel good, then pay attention to that. Anything that's going to you know, lower your self-esteem is important. Cutting out processed foods, refined sugars. Uh, a lot of the foods that we you know, know and love, sometimes they can hold us back diet-wise. Synthetic food dyes, like the colored, brightly colored cereals. Some studies have seemed to uh, suggest that they can make impulsivity and irritability worse uh, in kids with ADHD. So these are some of the practical things that we can do to kind of clean up our diet, make sure that we're not dumping a whole lot of sugar into our bodies, which can make it hard for us to focus. I mean, with ADHD, you know, it's difficult to get into that groove where you're finally motivated and you're focusing. So some of these things are the practical stuff, things that we can do to help ourselves out with ADHD. What are your top three favorite resources relating to ADHD, whether it's educational, support groups, all of that kind of thing? That's a great question. So I actually like that. It's called the Attitude Mag. I'm not sure if you've heard of it. AD, mm -hmm. ADD. I T U D E dot com. Mm -hmm. And I found out about them because one of my TikToks was featured on their website. And I went through and they have a whole lot of oh. great information from a lot of other mental health professionals. And it's like a safe space for people with mm -hmm. ADHD. Because once you go on there and you read up about, you know, hyper focusing, you know, or you read up about, you know, the financial 
you know, cost of ADHD and having to pay things over because you forgot mm-hmm. to pay a bill or you forgot to cancel a subscription. You feel seen and you feel heard. It's kind of like a safe space. So I love the, the Attitude Mag uh, website. I'm not sure the exact mm-hmm. website for it, but I love... I'll put it in the show notes so everyone can okay. find it. I love that website. I TikTok is a really nice place for for validation for people with ADHD. So there's many mm-hmm. different TikTok pages, including mine. I will say that if you, like, even if you're watching my TikToks, right, or another verified healthcare professional TikToks, like, of course, like, you know, back it up mm-hmm. to make sure that, you know, it aligns up with the latest evidence-based practices. And I always check that before I post, but TikTok is a great place. Yeah. And even if somebody's not a mental health professional and they're acting out a skit, it can make you feel seen and heard. So I think that's perfectly fine. As long as you realize that, you know, whoever you're watching, make sure that you, like, if they're an actor, you know that they're just an actor, right? But they can be your favorite page. Mm-hmm. Or if they're a healthcare professional, they know that, okay, yeah. this is where I can get evidence-based information. So just be mindful of they just verify your sources, but I love TikTok because it breaks it down in a fun uh, and easy way. And there's actually one more page on YouTube. I think her name is How to ADHD. One of my followers told me about her and I love mm-hmm. her page because she breaks like ADHD down uh, in terms of practical ways to like get through your day. Like she was talking about mm-hmm. a video where she set up her desk space so that way everything that she needed was right there. And that's very helpful because if you have ADHD I love that. and you're working in a space here, like I'm working on this computer with two screens, if I have to go downstairs to get something, mm-hmm. by the time I go downstairs to get something, I might get you know, sidetracked. I'm like, oh, I forgot to do this. this. Mm-hmm. And then when you come back, it's like two hours later and you, know, you lost track of time. <laughs> so she gives like a lot of practical tips. I wish I had her name, but I have to check out her page more. But I love her. Work. I'll find it and put it yeah, in, I the, love her, in the show Her website, too. her YouTube channel is very helpful. That's awesome. For peers of teens, individuals that have ADHD, how can you be supportive in in helping them navigate things or even just being a good friend, validating all of that? So Mm -hmm. first of all, I want to say uh, acceptance, right? You know, we all have, uh, you know, in our friend groups, we all have, you know, different individuals who do different things. We all have our own quirks, right? So I think it's important to accept your friend, but you can also put those boundaries in, in, um, in place. Like if you're a friend who has ADHD and they tend to cut you off. You know, you can, the way you say things is helpful. You can say, hey, you know, John, Terry, like, you know, you're, you're, you're my bro, you're my friend. But like, when you cut me off sometimes, it, it hurts my feeling. I know you don't mean to do it, but you can just be mindful of that. And then they're like, oh, okay, I'm sorry. And like, oh, no, it's cool. Like, I wanted to hear your story and, you know, please continue. But just, just letting you know, so that way, like, we can, you know, clear the air. So I think the way... You talk mm-hmm. to your friends is very helpful without making them feel bad. And even with me, I've talked about my personal journey with ADHD. And like, I've realized, you know, recently that my friends will tell me things that they've accepted about me. Like maybe I might cut somebody up mid conversation or I might, you know, jump in, you know, impulsively and add my two cents mm-hmm. in. And when they, you know, t- told me about it, I was like, oh, I've been doing this. And they're like, oh yeah, this is something that you do. Like, this is this how you are, you know? So when you have friends who accept you, that's mm-hmm. helpful. But there are times when my friends are like, oh, like, let, let, give me give me five minutes. Let me tell this story real quick. And I'll say, oh, my bad. Let me hear you out. So it's just mm-hmm. about having that safe space. People who respect you, if they respect you, they'll respect whatever you're going through. And I think that acceptance is going to make people feel a lot better. And people don't have that. And I know they don't have it because when you go on these online forums, like I read the comments, people will say, oh, I'm tagging my boyfriend in your video because this is like, I've never seen this broken down like this, or I've never seen somebody understand mm-hmm. me so people want to feel and if they can't get that in their everyday you know lives and they come online which i'm happy we have the safe space online to where people can have that understanding and, and that acceptance so if you can build that type of environment mm-hmm. in real life uh, that's going to do wonders for somebody with adhd just having one person who believes in you can be just as effective sometimes as the professional mm-hmm. treatment i believe and i'm somebody who i i recommend that you go out there and find you know professional treatment but like I was undiagnosed until I was 25. And I, in my opinion, I believe that I got as far as I got, you know, like went through school, had successful businesses and all that. But I got to that point because I had people who believed in me and people who were like, okay, you know, I, I think you're smart. I think you're brilliant. They put boundaries in place, but they were willing to wait on me and you know, they were willing to be patient with me until I got certain things off the ground. So having somebody who believes in you for the people who can't get to a professional or I know they can't get, you know, meds or therapy. Just having that support system, that's extremely underrated. 
Yeah, so important. I want to come at it from a parent's Mm -hmm. perspective as well. I know that the recommendations and ways to be supportive is so different when you have like younger children versus teenagers. But specifically for teenagers, how can a parent be helpful, offer resources, be supportive of their child um, who has ADHD? I think it's important for parents to, you know, (laughs) sometimes parents have to do the work on themselves, right? You know, even as a parent, you're so growing Mm -hmm. and you're in your own journey. We're all in our own journeys and our collective lives, you know, doing the best with the information that we have. And sometimes with parents, you know, when you tell a parent that, you know, I think your child has ADHD, sometimes they take it as a personal attack on themselves. Like I've seen that. And I don't know if it's because I come from Ghana, West Africa, and, you know, or in the black community, Mm -hmm. we don't talk about mental health as much. But when you tell a parent that their Mm -hmm. child has, you know, this mental health condition, a lot of times they see that, they either see that as bad parenting that you're trying to accuse them of being a bad parent or they're, they're saying that, oh, my child doesn't have this, we don't have this in our family, when in reality, ADHD is a, is a high genetic link with it. So you're most likely getting it from one of your parents. But it's hard for parents to accept mm-hmm. that your child has this condition. And if we proceed with treatment, it could change their 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 life. And I saw one psychiatrist on TikTok, he likened it to glasses, right? If your child has bad eyesight, you know that you can give them glasses and they can see good and they can do better in school wouldn't you you wouldn't want to withhold that from them so in in the same way if medications you know were like the glasses if they could dramatically improve your child's life their confidence their grades in school their social life you know their self-esteem wouldn't you want Mm -hmm. them to have you know the most abundant uh, life that they can have so when you you put it like that some parents start to get it so i think with parents it's important to understand that it's not a character flaw. Your child doesn't have um, ADHD because they're a bad child or because you're a bad parent. This is a condition that it's is not all the way understood, but we know that treatment, you know, whether it's for boys or for girls, even though girls seem to get diagnosed later in life, treatment for boys and girls equally, they do just as well. And the results show that if you treat and they have ADHD, it can, it can change their life. It can really change their life. So I think that's the, mm-hmm. when you paint, like if a child is coming in, they're 17, they're struggling to, you know, make it through their last year of high school and, you know, their self-esteem is in the gutter. If you paint a picture of that same child on the, the flip side with good grades, with friends, maybe a relationship, getting ready to go to college, when their, you know, their parents like can conceptualize, or, you know, or visualize their child in that, you know, uh, manner, then they're like, okay, you know what, I would like my child to have this life. So sometimes you have to really spell it out, you know, for the parents to really get it. Yeah. Uh, whereas the kids, sometimes they're not as hesitant to start treatment because, you know, they run out of options or frustrated and they're at the point where something has got to give. 100%. For listeners that want to follow along with you and keep learning about ADHD and consume your content, where can they find you? Uh, you can find me online, TikTok and Instagram. TikTok is at Sarfo. Instagram is just at Sarfo without the dot. Um, or my website, kojosarfo.com. So those are the main places where you can find me at. I actually have an ADHD ebook coming out where I'll break it down, kind of like we did in this amazing podcast. And I'll link it back to mm-hmm. some of my favorite TikToks to explain things about ADHD in women and, and ADHD in males, ADHD in relationships. Uh, and it's going to be free. So I'll put it out on my Instagram channel. So Make sure you follow on uh, the IG page. That way you can get access and download the ebook when it comes out. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. I think this will be so helpful to so many people that either know someone with ADHD or have ADHD themselves. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. In case you skipped to the end of the episode, Dr. Sarfo and I talked all about what ADHD is, how it can present differently in men, women, adults, children, and teenagers. We talked about what the diagnosis process looks like, what treatments he recommends, how to support a peer that has ADHD, how to support your child if they have ADHD, common questions he gets asked about it, and recommended resources. If you enjoyed this week's episode, please share it with a friend or family member who you think would love to listen and that it would resonate with. Leave a review wherever you're listening. Make sure you're subscribed. Follow on Instagram at She Persisted Podcast. All of the things you know what to do. I hope you enjoyed and I'll see you next Monday.